Welcome to Season 3 of The Lifestyle Chase, and I'm your host, Chris Little. This podcast features high performers who have found a way to live their best life while balancing their health, wellness, friends, and family. To help this podcast grow, please share it on social media, rate five stars, tell your friends, and check out the past 140 episodes and counting. You can follow me on Instagram at Christian Little and at The Lifestyle Chase. Thanks for listening. Let's get started. So welcome to The Lifestyle Chase. This is the first episode of Season 3, and it doesn't necessarily make it any different from Season 2. But I am joined today by the one and only Beverly Simpson for Episode 141. So how are you today? Chris, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm really excited. So what was your morning routine like today? Because I noticed you got up pretty early, like you were liking one of my posts at what might have been like <laughs> six hours ago or something like that. <laughs> um, I love this question. This is a great question. So I actually have been working I've been doing my best to stay really consistent with my morning routine because I have two little kids. And so my time when they are sleeping in the morning and when they go to bed, that that is very precious time to me. It's probably one of the only times that I have for myself. And so for me, it's really important that I set my intention for the day and also Chris knows this because he knows me, but for those of you who don't know me, I run a mile an hour, both in how I, like, I am really like just running all the time so fast. So it's very important to me that I take that time in the morning to slow down, set the intention for the day, journal, and then do that eat that frog work. So I'll do my social media connection work right in the morning, and then I I dive into my, and then I work out and dive into my day. So to give my audience a bit of an introduction to you, I'll give you an introduction to my audience. So my audience, um, I've got a good amount of people from Edmonton that listen, but then I've got uh, about 40% of my audience is based in the U.S. And there's been people that have listened to the show from as far as India, Australia, etc., And so if you were going to introduce yourself to all of these people in a matter of like a minute or less, what would your introduction sound like? I'm Beverly Simpson. I'm the owner of V Simpson Fitness, and I'm the founder of the PT Profit Formula. And I help personal trainers and clinicians connect and attract their ideal clients so that they can build personal so that they can build businesses both online and in person. And so now something I'm notorious for is going into the handy dandy time machine. Sometimes I think like if I (laughs) would only reflect back and be like, how many times have I said handy dandy time machine? But we're going to take you back, (laughs) back 15 years. Can you recall what life was like 15 years ago? Oh, my gosh, I can't even remember what I did seven days ago, Chris, let alone 15 years. Okay, so let's just let's do the math. It's 2020, right? So that's 2005, right? Yeah. Okay. So in 2005, I was actually living in California because that's where I grew up. I lived, I grew up in the Mountain View area. So I was living in California and I had just finished, I I was about a year out of college. And so I was in the grind of the real estate. This is really, this is, I can't believe this is way back there. I was an admin assistant for Cushman and Wakefield and I was chasing, and I was chasing that Broadway dream. So in fact, because I was an admin, you know, that was my day job and I was, auditioning and doing a whole bunch of theater, musical theater, because that's what my undergrad was in. That's what brought me to New York. I'm in New York now, and I've been here now for 12 years, but musical theater was what brought me to New York. So 
what was the the why or the the motivation towards doing what you were doing at that time like what what made you interested in musical theater theater what was your uh purpose mm. so you know chris my purpose has changed over the years as you know things have have gone along in my life but I wanted to do musical theater. I was an entertainer basically from the moment I was born and that I just wanted to be in front of people. I wanted to entertain. I loved singing. I really loved singing. And I think, and what's interesting to me now, as you know, just to, I'll go back on the time sheet, I swear. But what's interesting to me now is that all the things that I loved about performing and about musical theater, with the exception of singing, of course, I still get to do that in my daily life. I'm always on, I'm presenting, like I never feel, I don't feel like there's an absence of performing in my life. I feel like I do it all the time. So it's interesting to see how I still have stepped into what I'm meant to do, even though it doesn't look the way that I thought it was going to look back then. But I, uh, that was really my calling and why I loved it. I loved doing that. And so it caught, I was doing really well in California. And so I said, you know what, I just really want to give it a go because if I don't give it a go, I never will. So I went to, I went to, New York. And I went to like a uh, Cat 21. I went to a very intense musical theater graduate school. And what happened was that I, I had this belief or I had this, I had this yeah, belief is the right word, but I had this belief that my voice didn't match my body type. And so I was constantly chasing this specific look that I was supposed to look like based on the way that I sounded. And for the record, nobody said that. This was something that I had created in my mind, you know, and I had believed that that musical theater was a narcissistic industry. And I believed that it was constantly, you know, what do you look like? What do you sound like? And those were the pressures. And so that's what really brought me into fitness was that I was just chasing this look that I had to look a certain way and sound a certain way. And so what happened was that I was spending so much time in the gym. I took my day job there and I had this moment where I, I, I took a, a personal trainer job and I had this moment where I saw my client actually succeed. And it was such a fulfilling moment for me that she was so happy that she had done something that she had set her mind to do, which I think ultimately at the end of the day, that was also what I was chasing for myself is that I had, you know, could achieve what I was set out to do. And I felt like, oh, I need to leave this narcissistic industry because it's not fulfilling and move into theater or move into fitness. And what I have now recognized since I've had my two children is that that wasn't the case. It wasn't about the fact that theater was narcissistic. It was that I had had all of these beliefs about my body and what I should look like. And it didn't matter what industry I was in that, you know, wherever you are, wherever you go, there you are is what I ultimately discovered when I had my kids. And so it um, led me to where I am to where I am today, running my own business, you know, that whole, that whole progression from going from personal trainer to assistant fitness manager to fitness manager and growing that drive for achievement, which is something that's been with me since, you know, 15 years ago, 2005. That was awesome. And it gives me a lot to work with because this year has been unlike any other. We don't need to like beat the dead horse talking about COVID-19, but so much of this year has um, really reframed how people have seen things. I mean, you talked about uh, like just your image of yourself. I think that's a, something a lot of people can relate to in that we kind of, we get in our own way in a lot of cases. Um, when you were first moving to New York, like what was your inner monologue? Like, was there anything talking you out of it? Were you scared? What, what was that journey like? The journey was very, I mean, I was, of course I was scared, but not scared in the sense of, 
you know, actually, no, I wasn't scared. I was sad. Sad is a better way to say it because I was sad to leave my friends. I was, I had, you know, I've lived there since I was a little kid. You know, I had friends and I still am friends with those people today. I mean, my nearest and dearest friends are still in California and we still talk all the time. So I, that was hard. I was sad, but I was mostly excited. I was mostly excited for this new adventure. I had never lived in another state. I had never done, like I went to college and undergrad, but I, and that's actually my only regret. I actually don't live in regrets. I really do operate from a place of everything is happening for you and for a reason. But if you asked me if there was one thing I could go back and change, it would be this, is that I didn't live abroad when I had the opportunity in college. That's the only thing, because I do love to travel. Travel has been, it is a big thing for me. I love that. We took my kids to spit my daughter to Spain when for her first birthday. So travel was important. But um, I was mostly excited because I had never done anything outside of what I know. Yeah, yeah. So I was excited. Well, the cool thing is, I don't imagine you had a lot of certainty as to what to expect when going to New York. Like, did you know everything was going to go as planned? Did everything turn out the way you expected it to? Absolutely not. I mean, it was a hundred percent nothing like I thought it was going to go, but it was still, you know, I'm just so glad I'm still live here. I mean, first of all, first of all, when I first arrived for any of you who've never been to New York, it, and I mean, it's different now, but back then it was very, I couldn't sleep for the first week because that that whole concept of the city never sleeps that's a real thing like the energy in the city was just so intense that i felt overstimulated for a long period of time and now recognize too that i was coming from this i was i already had a job i was an admin assistant i was living on my own and then i came to new york and now all of a sudden it kind of felt like i was stepping back in time in terms of my development because I was literally, you know, now I'm waitressing, I'm back in grad school. I kind of felt like I had gone back in time as opposed to moving forward, even though I was moving forward. It just was a different, it just felt different. And I had in San Francisco, I was living in San Francisco in my own apartment and you could see the Golden Gate Bridge from my house. And now I'm living in Harlem in, in an apartment that I had never even seen and my room was so small it could only fit my bed and 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 when you put my bed on loft you couldn't sit up in my bed otherwise you were hitting the ceiling and then you couldn't stand straight in my room because I had my bed in there that's what it was like so I felt like I was you know I turned 26 back to 18. That. Uh well, I mean, that is powerful perspective because like so much of what this year has encompassed and so much of what anybody's like career in the fitness industry will involve is like a whole bunch of like moments where you're not sure if you want to make that next move because you don't know what's coming. And then in most of the conversations that I have with people, um, they don't really have that much re regrets. Like they, they might have wished they would have like traveled a bit more or um, spent time in, in different environments or different um, rooms kind of thing. Just like so much of this year has been like the virtual room, like getting to be in conversations with people that you wouldn't have otherwise thought to have a conversation with. Um, when it came to like your development in the fitness industry, like when you're getting all these promotions and stuff, like what was that like? Was, was it challenging? Was it as you expected? Did it come as a surprise? No, what happened was that, no, it didn't come, it, it didn't come as a surprise and it wasn't challenging. I mean, of course there's going to be challenges, right? And I know that I'm hesitating on that, but I really do operate from this perspective that nothing, that everything that is happening to me, no, even if it's good, bad, whatever that interpretation is, it is happening to me for a reason. Like I'll give you an example, right? You keep, you brought up COVID and you talked about how that has that experience for many fitness 
professionals has been life changing for them, completely altered anything that they thought their vision. I mean, you see these memes now and it's funny. I laugh, but you see these like journals or these planners that are just on fire for 2020 because it's just nothing that we expected could have ever happened. But for, for me, when COVID hit, it, I was I was so grateful for all the things that had gone bad and wrong and awful in the years prior. I mean, there was last summer, and I've told this story on a on a previous podcast before. But last summer, there was a moment where my husband and I were driving back from Michigan, and, and he said to me, he was like, "I don't think there's room on our credit card for to put gas in the car." And I was like, "Oh, cross your fingers, just try anyway." Right. And so I'm so grateful for that moment. It's better now. Right. We're fine now. But uh, uh, I'm so grateful for that moment because now when I was faced with COVID, I thought, oh, it's okay. I can face anything once I've faced that, knowing that I had two children and that I'm leaving my job and the way that it looks. And I moved out of Manhattan into Westchester. I have faced that. I can face this. Like to me, I almost felt like this is exciting. Now I can help people change the way that they're looking at it. For me, it's always about perspective. Perspective. It's always about looking at it from, you know, what can I learn from this? Because you're either going to get the success that you want or the lesson that you need. Right. So, so for me, when, you know, when I started, when I got, when I got into the fitness world, I learned from, you know, our mutual friend, Kyle Dobbs, he was not at first, but eventually he became my fitness manager. He was the one that promoted me to his AFM at the time. But I learned everything that about science of training from him back then. And then as he grows and develops, I continue to just follow his lead in that in that regard. But for me, I was so excited to meet him and to learn because I have such a drive. That is just something that's innate. And hey, friends, for the record, that's both my curse and my blessing that need to achieve because I was just constantly going after it. it I, I really wanted to help my clients to the best of my ability. And so I was learning, reading, studying. I mean, I lived in the gym. This was back in the time when I didn't have children. So for me, I was happy and I, I, was, I was going for the, that type of achievement. So it, I wasn't surprised. I was one of the quickest personal trainers in that company to go up the ladder from trainer to AFM to fitness manager to district fitness manager. But I'm not surprised in the sense because I, I go after it. And I do, I do tend to be the person that sets their mind on something and then I'm relentless. I won't stop until I achieve it. Both a blessing and a curse. Well, I mean, that's something that I can definitely <laughs> relate to. It's just like we, we get that tunnel vision and it's just a lot of things take the back burner and you get driven to the extent that you are willing to take your failures as lessons and you are willing to, to see the value in every possible experience, whether it was positive or negative. Um, something that really caught my attention that I think a lot of people will find helpful is like you talk about that experience where it's like will this card actually clear the the transaction for gas like uh let's dive into that a bit further if if you're willing and um talk yeah, about what led up to that moment and what that was like and like how you overcame that mm uh sure and i will say this as a disclaimer right for anyone who's listening is that like i'm not in in terms of you know i in terms of financial advice like that is definitely you know meet with your financial advisor i have met with mine we've cleared that up right now you know so we are we're good it's not something necessarily that i would recommend as i tell this story just for the record but for me, what happened is that I am a coach, right? I'm a coach both in as a trainer, I'm a trainer and also as a business coach. So for me, I am someone who values coaching so much to the to the extent that I I I can't in good conscience ask somebody to invest in me if I'm not investing in myself. And so what had happened is that when I decided to go into my own online business, I didn't know what I was doing. So I hired a coach to help me do it. Right. And so it just took so many coaches. I had to go through a lot of people before I could decide, you know, who was actually going to give me a good ROI. And I, it just, 
took me a long time to figure that out. And I made decisions not knowing that, you know, not knowing that there was a better way. And again, this is not about it being bad or wrong or that those coaches did did anything bad. They didn't. They just gave me the lessons that I needed. If I could go back and tell my, you know, talk to my younger self about, you know, the investment choices that you are going to make in yourself and in your business, you just better get really clear on what that ROI is going to look like for you because it's important, but there are a lot of people out there that are claiming to be the, you know, the latest and greatest, but you need to have some metrics that matter. And that's not to say that everything's all sun, you know, sunshine and roses because when it comes to marketing and just like fitness, right? If you're chasing a fitness goal or working on a fitness goal, it's not a linear progression. It's all about guessing, testing, and assessing. And I live by that mantra. And so now I know what the metrics are that matter. Now I can look at how my business is running on a quarterly basis as a business and know where the areas of opportunity are to increase performance. When back then, when I got into debt and got into trouble, I didn't. It was like I was, it was as if I was just throwing spaghetti on the wall and hoping that something sticks. But now I now I am much smarter in terms of my investments, both in the business and in myself and know, you know, what my areas are of opportunity. And I'm much more discerning in terms of how I spend or how I invest in the business. Now, that's not to say that I don't invest. I do invest all the time. And and I still operate from a place of abundance because that was also part of it. I was coming from this place and I still live by that place where I knew that it was going to come. I already operate knowing that it's going to happen. My success being inevitable was not a question. I knew it was going to happen. It was just a matter of time and a matter of getting all the puzzle pieces in the right places. So that was how and why I was making those financial decisions. And I still operate from that, knowing that, you know, my business will go from multiple six figures into the seven figure mark. I know that that's going to happen. I just am now much more discerning. And that is by design. That is so that I can feel safe and sleep and know that my kids can eat so it's more and my kids can go to school and that they get what they need so it's it's so i can still be both abundant and operate from that place and and still invest in what i know in coaches that i know will help me and that's not about like oh you know they need to get my business at seven figures or they're not a good coach that's not what this is because it's actually not about outcomes it's more about the process and it's about knowing can you assess what's happening inside of the process and can you assess where the areas of opportunity are to increase performance that's what matters to me and so but I just didn't you know you don't know what you don't know I didn't know that back then I do now but I uh, so that, so now I'm just much more discerning. So I, and it's better. Well, I like that. And you brought up the word discernment, discerning. Um, that's something that, uh, intrigues me and I'll give some, some context. So like when it comes to mentorships, mentors, people who help others in this industry, it's like, it's one of those things that either like makes me feel better or just totally sets me off because there are just so many people out there that might not have my best interests at heart. And I've found like, I would have to say it kind of comes back to talking about core values, talking about like things beyond like the outcome, but yeah, that journey. And when, when I can find that I align with like the journey of someone else, or if I can align with the values of someone else, then I'm more positioned to get a, a better outcome. And so like, I will say that I am kind of like snobby when it comes to people that help me with, with stuff, which makes me excited to like bring you onto the podcast. Cause for you, you're someone who stands out to me as someone that can help people with their marketing and their social media. And you have like sat in the shit for a bit. You've had to struggle and learn things the hard way. And yeah you've you have tried to throw the spaghetti at the fridge and and see what sticks like that is something that is necessary like if if we want to have like the the medals of honor we have to go to war kind of thing like it's just it's necessary but 
going back to what we were going to talk about more is like that that act of discerning like if you were to create a rubric for how you discern your choices your Mm -hmm. everything what what is that based off of what's your rubric Mm. that is a really good question how do i determine you know what is a sound investment and what is not because at the end of the day you know when we're talking about it in terms of like in terms of this right so things that i'm investing in and when i use that word i'm talking about you know paid traffic i'm talking about mentorship in terms of you know my own having my own coach and i'm also talking about you know investments in terms of um you know, growing because as you grow, you're going to need to take on a team. And so there's going to be a period of time where you're going to be more on the investment, whether you are investing in finances, resources, or time. Time and money are inverses of each other. And I tend to be more discerning with my time because time you can't get back. But money, we can always find, attract, whatever resonates with you. So for me, and hey, also for the record too, I just want to say, I've also learned, I, it's true, I have learned things the hard way and I'm glad because now I can help my clients not do the same thing, you know, don't, uh, don't make the same mistakes that I did, but just know that these things that we're talking about in terms of, you know, business growth, I think a lot of trainers and a lot of people, business owners, right, if we don't have a good relationship with our money, and when I say good relationship, I mean, know what's happening with your money, know what your money is doing, then now with whatever amount that you're making if that biz, if that relationship doesn't exist now what's causing you to think that it's going to exist all of a sudden when you achieve this arbitrary 10k a month that people are often chasing i think what happens for so many and i know this happened happened for me it was i lived by this well oh it it'll be okay when i make 10k a month I'll just figure it out when I make 10K a month. And it was just that arbitrary number, not recognizing, number one, 10K a month does not mean 10K salary. You could be making 10K a month, but how much needs to go back into the business (laughs) in terms of your Facebook advertising, in terms of your employees, in terms of whatever it is that you, you know, your overhead. And I also think, and, you know, as you grow, when you get, you know, new level, new devil, right? Now you've made all these sales and now you have to work on the fulfillment, but how are you also keeping the top of the funnel functioning? You're only one person and 24 hours in a day is finite amount of resource and people give that away freely. So I think for me now, when I'm looking at those kinds of things, um first of all it took me some time but i did find my mentor that speaks that helps me that helps me with my marketing it is somebody that i can uh, i work with I, I work with james james wedmore and so i i feel really good about that i can point to my successes i can point to the things that he's helped me with specifically so i'm i'm finally solid on that <laughs> but that took some time Right. That took some time guessing and testing to see who works for you, because it's not that my other coaches were bad or wrong. I see tons of value in what I learned from them, but it's more about just making sure that your mentor speaks to you, that your mentor can help you and actually say what they're going to you know, do, what they say that they're going to do and follow through. That is a huge component. That is really important to me is that being able to follow through and then knowing what's happening inside my business. It's just something that's really important to me as a coach. And I didn't recognize that or know that until later, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that was, you know, that's one thing, but now for me, I'm just making sure that I'm out of debt. Like that is something that like, I want to make sure that I'm out of debt and that, so when I'm decide when I'm making decisions that are financial, that maybe, uh, like for example, in this la- last launch, I had budgeted two, five grand for my Facebook advertising, but then things didn't start go things didn't go well at first. Like, Hey, listen, I'm not immune. Things go wrong in my business all the time. So the second I could see that it wasn't firing off the way that I wanted it to, I pulled back and I made that choice to pull back because I needed to make sure that my offer converts. 
And so, you know, I'll make, you know, so I just have, you know, specific things that I know and I, I make the decision. I think that's the other thing too, that CEOs, if you're running your own business to so recognize, you're just making decisions all day long. And so for me, I'm always going through worst case scenario. If I lost this two grand, would this mean that I go into debt? No, great. I'm good. Would this mean that my business goes under and that I have to wrap things up? then good. No. Is this 2K scary and going to strap me and I'm going to have to sacrifice some other things? Yeah, it could. So I'm going to make that choice, but at least it's, I won't be in debt. Right. So those are kinds of the things that, those are kind of the barometers and the pro thought process that I go through when I'm making decisions. And also, you know, and that's how I'm able to, to stay abundant because I'm not operating from this place of, money is a you know finite resource i don't believe that i really do think that we can we can attract it we can get it we can find it we can make it but i'm just uh i'm very careful and me and do my best to make financially sound decisions and so far since last summer we're good now it's been going well that's awesome um Something that you got me thinking about with all of this, because a lot of people, I mean, they'll get uh, sort of attached to that idea of like hustle. And in, in some ways, it can be that idea of it's not work unless it's tied to a certain amount of money, like um, it's not marketing unless you are investing in Facebook. And, and that's not necessarily the case for everybody. Um, when it comes to creating more of like a long-term sustainable growth mindset approach like what are the the holistic things that you need in order to like stay sane and in order to um have like a a fulfilling lifestyle and not burn out like every couple months kind of thing i love this question and it's a hard question for me to answer because listen i'm a high d for those of you who know what that is on the disc assess assessment. I am a driver. I'm a driver, 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 and I will, I tend to hustle all the time, but I really worked on what I like to call the seasons of hustle because it's, and what I mean by seasons of hustle. And I think that, you know, especially if you've got fitness professionals that do listen to this or people who are active, actively working out, you know, that the rest is in the work or the, yeah, that rest is the work, essentially. Your muscle is recovering, your rest, the, your work is in the rest. And so for me, I have to remind myself and I have to put myself in that, uh, to remind myself that it's important to be in that season. And so, and to recognize too, and this is something that I, I think had come from the gym days is that, and I think that it happens to a lot of trainers is that we're so used to training dollars for hours and that we think in order to earn more, we have to work harder and work more hours. But friends, it's just not true. It's not true. Why? Because everyone only has 24 hours. That's all that there is, right? So we have to figure out ways that we can leverage our time. Otherwise, you can't train 24 hour, you know, 24 sessions in, in in a day. It's just not possible. Right? And so we have to find those ways to we have to find those ways that we can leverage our time. And so for me, when I also look out into the space and when I'm trying to like, you know, get out of that hustle mentality and stop working harder, because it's not about working harder, it's about working smarter. I look out into the into the field and I ask myself, who's doing what I want to do? And I'm not doing that in a case of, you know, I'm not looking at that to try and compare myself. That's not the, comparison is the thief of joy. I can't remember, Eleanor Roosevelt, I think said that, but it's not about comparing, but I'm I'm looking at that and I'm looking at those people and I'm celebrating their success because it's just evidence. That is evidence to my brain that I can do what they can do because what's possible for them is possible for you. So that's how I'm, I'm always looking at it. And for me, and this is just me personally, and I think a lot of trainers have to, you know, go through are similar to this and it's just my opinion, but I have to fight that need to hustle because I do hustle. Like, I am not a stranger to hustle and I actually actively spend time to avoid it. I don't want to, I don't want, it's just too easy for me to fall into that trap. And it is a trap, make no mistake, because the rest is in the, the work is in the rest. 
So that's why I've set up my business to have what I now call seasons of hustle, because listen, you know, there's a spectrum, right? It's a paradox. There's a paradox in fitness and there's a paradox in fitness business, which is that, okay, Beverly, so you don't want to hustle, you know, but then on the other side of the spectrum, people are like, let's look at that four hour work week, right? It's not about, it's not about how many hours, you know, how, how, how much it's not it's not about like how much can i work in the shortest amount of time possible it's more how efficient can i work and get my machine running in order to have more time for rest and increase my profit margin that's really what it's about working efficiently so now i've built into my business seasons of hustle where i'm spending the time working on the top of the funnel and increasing the audience and running my launch and running my sales and and trying you know trying to generate the revenue right that's one that's a season and then i go into my more times like right now where i'm just in fulfillment and i'm i've got some things that are always slow burning in the back but that i'm just spending the time connecting with the people that are already here and fulfilling on the people that are already here because i think that's also an area of opportunity that a lot of trainers miss is that they are just always looking for more 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 when if they could just stop and connect and spend more time with who's already here that's only going to help you with your top of funnel well i think that's an awesome like takeaway for people to understand like everything that you need is already like in your environment it's just about like looking at it differently and looking at the, those inefficiencies and looking at where like the money may escape but we've talked about so many things that kind of coincide they kind of like they're expected they're anticipated and we've talked about fitness um you are a mother and like how did that journey begin mm. <laughs> uh yes i am a mother that is true and it's really funny it's you know, it's funny. So what happened, and it's funny because nobody thought I was going to have children, at least in my family, right? They, I got, I met my husband the second night I was in New York, by the way, and I've been in New York now for 12 years. We've been together for 12 years, almost 13. And um, we got married in 2011 and we just were not, we were just not, we were living the life. I mean, I kick myself now, but again, this is all about lessons, right? These are lessons that I need. But back then we were a two income family, just the two of us living in Manhattan. I mean, we joke now about how we thought we were broke then, but I'm laughing and I'm like, we were broke because we gave all our money to the Indian restaurant around the, around the corner. I mean, we <laughs> Um, those were the days anyway. So what happened was that I was, and I was, and I'm actually, this is still true. I'm not really awesome with children. Uh, I'm awesome with my children, but when I was around other kids, like I just didn't, I wasn't, not that I didn't like them. I didn't, wasn't that I disliked them. It wasn't that it was just that I was just kind of awkward. I'm not really a kid person. And so no one thought I was going to have children. <laughs> And then what happened was what, it was Christmas time of 2015. Yeah, it was Christmas or 2000. Yeah, Christmas of 2014. And mind you, my husband and I have been married now for almost five years. And we thought we were pregnant. And it turned out that we weren't. And so I was disappointed. So that was when that moment when I was disappointed that I wasn't pregnant. And I was 33 at the time, or 32 at the time. And so... When I felt that disappointment, I said, okay, listen, it's now or never. We're either doing this or we're not. And we decided to do it. So we ended up having my eldest daughter, who's now, who's turning five in October. She was born October 2015. So we got pregnant that January. And then we wanted the, <laughs> we wanted the, there to be a two year age difference. But um, so we thought it was going to take us some time. Turns out it didn't. And so our kids are 20 months apart. We had Abigail in 2017. And so what happened, I mean, they are my greatest 
they, and I live by this and I'll say this forever, they are my greatest teachers. They are my greatest teachers. And more often in this life, I think that if adults could spend more time, maybe not moving, because it's not saying that they're movement efficient, just for the record, but their personality and the way that they show up in the world, I want to be more like them than I want them to be like me, right? They just teach me so much about love and compassion and curiosity and confidence like children are taught you know i fear is brain based but there are a lot of fear components that they get taught right so anyway um all that to say that when i became a mom in 2015 i was still working at my gym i was still the fitness manager at the gym and i stayed there for a year then i got pregnant and my pregnancies for the record were awful. They were truly horrible. I had two terrible birth. I had two terrible births and two terrible pregnancies, which led me to what I was doing, which is I recognized, I mean, I had been a trainer in the field at that time now for a couple of years. And I thought, I thought, oh, I'm so smart. I'm the smartest trainer in the world. You know, ego, ego's, ego's the enemy. Ryan said that. Um, but, but then all of a sudden I got pregnant and I was like, what is this body? What is this alien inside of me? This is terrible. I mean, I went as far as my sister told me not to Google, and I didn't. I didn't knew nothing about what was going to happen, what was going to happen after. So much so, I was on a phone call with her, and she said, Beverly, you know, you're still going to look pregnant when the baby comes out. I was like, wait, why? No, the baby's out. Right? So it was, it was quite an experience. And that was, that was the biggest transition of my life. That was when I was like, oh, that was that moment. And that birth, the birth of Gwen was when I recognized and realized I had so much inner work to do about body image, about, about, I mean, just literally everything because your whole world changes. It, it becomes more about, you know, I, I thought that that was when I recognized that it wasn't the theater industry that was narcissistic. It was me that was narcissistic. And your whole world kind of becomes, what is the type of role model that you want to be for your kids? And so when I asked myself those questions, I recognized I needed to make some bigger, bigger changes in my life, both in how I viewed my body, both in how I was working, my work ethic, both in, you know, my, and then both in my rest, making sure that I'm prioritizing time for them because I've said this uh, multiple times on the podcast, but it's true time. We can't get back. And so I can't, you know, this time that I have with them here with me, it's going to go so fast. I will blink and they'll be grown. Hopefully. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was pretty powerful in the sense that, uh, it left me with something to think about that I can really stem from here. You, you talked about how that Christmas that you thought that you were going to be expecting and then the disappointment that you felt and then that realization that like something that you didn't see yourself doing then became something that you were disappointed with that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Like there's mm -hmm. so much in front of us that we don't know what it's like to experience but had we gotten a taste mm -hmm. of it we'd be disappointed if we didn't go into it um and mm -hmm. there's certainly no no certainty to that but it really makes a person wonder like why why are we not taking more risks on ourselves why are we not doing that inner work that we need in this time that we have like 2020 might be a crazy year but it doesn't mean that uh we can't push the needle in, in some way. It doesn't mean that we mm -hmm. can't know what we don't know. Um, when it came to um, doing the inner work, what was your aha moment? Like what were some things that stood out to you in like body image and self-awareness and finding that you needed to, to rest and all that stuff? So I have a mentor and his name is Jim Fortin and he is, um, he talks about how, and this is going to sound dark, but it's true. He talks about how death is our greatest teacher. And I think if COVID has taught us anything, it really has in the sense that A, we need to prioritize our health and B, anyone, and there are multiple people that have experienced an unanticipated loss in their life. And it's always those moments where we come to this, this, you know, crossroads for, you know, lack of a better word, a metaphor, if you will, of where you recognize and you have that moment of like, if I had, if, 
you know, I wish maybe you don't say I wish, but it's that moment of like, for me, that moment of loss where you're like, this is, it's that, it's that wake up call. It's that recognition of like, I've been asleep to myself. And that just, I think it comes, I think it's brain. I know that it's brain based. We do 95% of what we do is done on automation. It's habit based part of our habits and and that fear urgency that we get is designed to keep us safe at any time we're making a change whether it's positive or negative that fear urgency is going to send a signal to keep us safe so so I was working so I've been working with Jim for a while who helps me a lot on this personal um on the personal development side in terms of the recognition recogni- uh, recognizing this but what happened for me in terms of that body image was that my kid came out and I, well, two things. I was so desperate and I mean desperate to have a, what I called at the time a natural birth, which is now, you know, a vaginal birth, right? I, I use a vaginal birth. I was so desperate to have that and I was so desperate to breastfeed. And the two main reasons when I look back on that, it's because I wanted my body back and I wanted my body back at any cost. And when I say at any cost, I mean that I literally, like Gwen, my eldest, she had a failure to descend. So she, my pelvis is too small to, to, for her to come out. But I was so determined that I was like screaming, go and get the forceps. Like I wanted the doctor to like compromise my life essentially to bring Gwen into this world. And for why and for what? For my body, to get my body back. And it wasn't until my husband came into the room. And now my husband, for those of you who know him or have seen him, he's like six four stoic police detective like he you know it's just um you know very just kind of very emotionally detached and he comes but not he just seems like he is but he comes into the labor and delivery room and he's crying and he's standing next to me and he's crying and he's saying beverly please just have the c-section like just go and have a cesarean and and I'm like, why are you crying? And it turns out later that it was because the doctor had told him, like, listen, you're going to lose your wife and you're going to lose your daughter if she doesn't get over this and go and do the cesarean. And so when I went, I mean, I was in this, I went and had the cesarean, like they had to put me under general anesthesia. I like, it was such a whirlwind of time, right? It's five years now. But when you look back on it and you're like, oh, you mean I was going to die? And you mean Gwen was going to die? And you think, well, why would you ever do that? And when you start asking yourself those questions and realizing that it was for the sake of how you looked, that's kind of like punches you in the face and says, okay, Beverly, you've got some work to do. If you're really going to do, you know, at all, at all cost, you need to take a look at that. And that was when it was starting to be like, oh, the theater industry was never about that. It was never about how I looked. I was the one who said that. I mean, that takeaway, you know? that's something that people honestly need to hear. There's a lot of new parents that gravitate towards my podcast. There's lots of my friends in the industry that are going to be growing their family. Um you help people now with your past experiences. Like I snooped your website mm-hmm. and stuff like what are the greatest connecting pieces that you have to kind of guide people along with with their parenthood experience or their body image experience when it comes to just mm. fitness and stuff? Mm-hmm. So I will say that I did. I have moved away a lot from the the mom from the mom world, but you know those those two stories. Oh, and for the record, I couldn't breastfeed; it was terrible, and so I ended up gaining like sixty pounds. Right, so I I had an extra fifty pounds. So I have. So now you're looking at a mom who has, for me personally, right? I'm I'm on a small frame. Like my pelvis was small; I couldn't birth children, and I have an extra sixty pounds. So I am correct, and I already have body image stuff. So I literally am in this body that I couldn't recognize. And so for me, what happened? And for the record, those two stories, I'm so grateful for that they happened because if it didn't happen, I never would have been able to. I would never be here and I would never be able to help the hundreds of moms that I have helped. And so for me, the linchpin, right? So I now teach, you know, trainers how to find their unique mechanism. What is it that is specific for you that sets you apart in the marketplace? And for me, it was this, and it's been very, it 
was very rewarding but challenging to get people to see, which is that your weight loss journey, there is nothing wrong with wanting weight loss, but it's not going to fix your mental image of yourself. That your weight loss has to, is an outcome and it is a reflection of how you feel about yourself on the inside. So my weight loss did not, my weight loss journey for the first time ever when after having children, it was not actually about how many calories were in, how many, you know, what's my macro count, what's my macro breakdown. It was more like, hey, can you look at yourself in the mirror today and love yourself now as it is? And if nothing were to change, would you be okay? And it was more about recognizing what my habits were, what my self-talk was and changing that first. Weight loss, sustainable weight loss, that is that in my opinion and what I taught was about started from the inside. It started from recognizing and, and it started from your habits because you need to be the person that is healthy and fit from the start. And it's not about the outcomes. It's about what's inside and people who feel healthy and fit. And I mean, really healthy and fit. I don't mean that look like I'm not talking about people that ha that struggle with their own body image, like, cause you've got personal trainers on the other side, right there. They're, you know, doing cardio and doing, you know, body competition. They've got body dysmorphia too. It's just different. So I'm talking about a real, someone who's really healthy and fit. They're not looking at themselves, berating themselves all day in the mirror. That, so for me, I start there. That was where I needed to start. And so it was kind of one of those like, hey, you can't change what you don't know. And so it needs to be brought, you need to bring, you need to bring attention and bring awareness to what is it that you were saying to yourself about yourself. And you know what? This is another reason why I love children. Because if you don't know, listen to what they repeat. Wow. What do they say about their body and their diet? Because what they repeat is what you say. That, yeah, that is true. Like, I mean, even with me and my nieces, like I, I hear what uh, comes up. I hear what is the most frequently said phrases and points and things that attention is drawn towards. Um, something that I want to showcase in this episode. So we talked about how you've kind of helped me with my social media and you've been part of the, the compound performance mentorship. And I know as a trainer that uh, referrals, testimonials are probably one of the most powerful things that we can do. And so I'll give some context as to you and your offerings and how it stands out to me being someone who's very snobby about uh, people whose help that I seek. And so I'll break it down. Like you are able to assess a person's who they are, what they're about, and without changing them, bring out who they are in a, a better light. So you audited my Instagram and I've always been so like uh, stubborn that I wouldn't change like who I am. Like I'm not going to be like, I help young entrepreneurs. <laughs> like it's just the voice that I'm going to put out is always going to be <laughs> my voice. And you yeah, were you were able to you were able to let me maintain that, and so that is why I'm going to explain a bit further. It's just like it's kind of like you said with your mentor, um, helping to find those little inefficiencies, uh, not necessarily even changing what a person does, but just how they do it, um, how they manage their time, how they manage their energy, helping them discover like okay like is money tied to the amount of hours or is money tied to the value that you have to offer? Um, so I'm going to open the window up for like, do you have anything coming up that uh, a person could get the chance to, to see what you're all about? And first of all, thank you. That is so kind of you to say. I mean, I really do live with that, you know, live with that. And it's something that one of my mentors is a false, has also said to me is that the truth of the matter is that all of the answers and is inside of you. You already know what you want to do. You already know what your message is and who you want to help. You already know that. The job of the coach, in my humble opinion, is to remove the roadblocks and to help you see clarity. That's it's not to give you the latest, like, here's the latest, greatest funnel. Here's this is the best. This is the best. Because listen, at the end of the day, it all works. It's just like diets, right? It's just like fitness. At the end of the day, it's all about, you know, it all works. It, it's more about, you know, what's the most effective and efficient way possible 
to to get it get it to go and that's going to resonate for you and can you find that coach that mentor that is going to remove those roadblocks for you in a way that works for you so i'll say that the best way if you want to come hang out and find out what i'm I'm about come hang out with me on Instagram. I'm at, I'm at at B Simpson Fitness, and in that link, and there's a bio. The, in the bio, there's a link for you to download your content calendar, your content planner, rather, and it'll walk you through a process of how you can start finding your message and what to post for the next seven days, so that you can connect and uh, attract and connect with your ideal client. So if you want to check that out, that's where that would live. And it's amazing how much like one incremental step in the right direction can like enlighten a person. Like sometimes it is true, like you don't know what you don't know. And so when you kind of take the time to set aside like the couple hours a day to like commit to a process, then you get like that feedback as to like, oh, like I actually applied this concept that was put in front of me and I saw like, I saw progress. I, I saw that what I was already doing wasn't the wrong thing, but maybe a different way about doing it garnered a, a better outcome. Um, I'm going to segue <laughs> into a couple final questions. And so one of the questions which I ask 100% of my guests, except for the times that I forget, is if you could get one... <laughs> If you could give one piece of advice on how to live your life to the fullest in the most authentic way, what would that piece of advice be? The number one piece of advice that I would give that I haven't already said, I'll say that, is that the faster you can detach yourself from outcomes, the better. And what I mean specifically about that is that anything that happens in your business, in your life, in your fitness goals, anything, whether it is positive or whether it is negative, the faster that you can emotionally detach from it. And, and when I say detach, I mean detach meaning about who you are as a person, as uh, based on the outcome, the better, the more fulfilling of a life you're going to feel. Because if you set a goal and you don't reach it, it doesn't mean anything about you as a coach. It doesn't mean anything about you as a person. And it all, and the way that I explain that is, listen, I want you to think about, especially for new parents or parents that are on here, go back to that moment when you first held your baby and ask yourself, did you hold that baby and say, I'll love you when? I love you when you have that business. I love you when you lose that, you know, last 10 pounds. I will love you when you get 50. No, you didn't. That baby was just perfect. And all that baby did was eat, poop and cry. That's it. Okay. That baby was worth it just because that baby exists. And so when you can detach yourself from the negative, the negative feedback, the better. And then also the positive. If you, make a million dollars, you make 250K, you get, you crush that client goal. That also doesn't mean anything about you. doesn't mean anything. It just is an outcome. And the idea is that you can increase the performance of that outcome and you live your life fully just because you are who you are today. Well, I really liked that analogy. Like that's something that even non-parents could like really absorb. I mean, mm -hmm. to understand that like, if we're all out there eating, pooping, and sleeping, we're just fine. <laughs> we we can we're love ourselves. Fine. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Another thing that I do for each episode is I'll get the guest to give a challenge for the day. And so essentially, like, the floor is all <laughs> yours. You get to say your episode challenge for the day is and just let them have it. And it could be based on anything? Anything at all. Anything that they want to do. Okay. So because I'm a marketer and I'm a content creator, I will say that your episode challenge for today is to go out there and post one post on Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn or anything. Even if you're not a, you're not a professional fitness professional and you're just, you know, a, you're a fitness enthusiast. I want you to go out there and post something that's going to connect to your people that makes you feel uncomfortable but do it anyway. I love that. I think that's a great way to get somebody introspective. If they're having a tough time, it's a great way to reflect. 
and kind of just remind yourself that no matter what shit you're sitting in today, you're going to be just fine because you're eating, pooping, and sleeping. <laughs> That's right. Everything You are enough as you are today, and everything is fine. It's always going to be fine. So thank you so much for joining me. That wraps it up for today. Okay, great. Thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun.